I'm so honored and thrilled to join you again this year. And you can imagine how my heart bursts with joy and pride to have such a student as the Reverend Dr. Stephen Swisher, uh, the most accomplished and most highly valued student that I've had in all these years of teaching. So thank you for supporting him in his ministry. And he has shared with me some of the wonderful work that is being done here in this great church in this city. And I rejoice in all of that. As printed in the bulletin, our subject tonight is at the foot of the cross. Some years ago, when my older son was going through the process of confirmation at our church, he was reading the Gospel of Mark, the passage that was so well read for us tonight. And he was 12 years old, not yet driving, so every day I would drive out to the school that he attended and pick him up after school. On most occasions, he came bouncing out of the classroom, plopped himself down in the seat next to me, and began to babble away about all of the things he had learned that day. But on this occasion, he walked out slowly with his head down and sat in the seat next to me in silence. And we'd been driving for about five minutes in total silence, and finally I looked over at him, and he looked up at me with tears in his eyes, and he said, Larry, you have to tell me, why did the best man who ever lived have to die like that. Imagine uh, a bright spring day, you come to pick up your son from school and he comes out and lays that kind of question on you. And it was the right question, wasn't it? He felt the force of Mark's gospel. The author of the third gospel, Luke, looks back on the life of Jesus and summarizes Jesus of Nazareth, anointed by God with the Holy Spirit, who went about doing good and liberating all of those who were oppressed because God was with him. Why did this man who went about doing good, proclaiming God's kingdom, healing the sick, why did he end up on an instrument of torture outside the walls of Jerusalem in the most humiliating and violent death devised by the Roman Empire? That is the question. And tonight I invite you for the next few minutes to walk with me around the foot of the cross where together we will ask, we will ask my son's question of each of the following. First, the crowds. Second, the women. Third, the beloved disciple and Jesus' mother, Mary. Fourth, the thief crucified alongside Jesus. And finally, the Roman centurion. According to Luke chapter 19, when Jesus entered the city on what we now call Palm Sunday, the multitude was rejoicing and praising God with a loud voice shouting out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna 
to the son of David. But only a few days later, Luke describes in chapter 23 how the Roman governor Pilate, in his perplexity over the case of Jesus, turned to the people, to the crowds, and said, what should I do with him? And Luke says that they all cried out together, away with this man and release for us Barabbas. They then cried out, crucify him. And Luke concludes, they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. Now, what accounts for this dramatic change in the attitude of the crowds? Jewish literature of the period makes clear that it was disappointment that Jesus did not fulfill the role of the Messiah, the son of David, that was expected. There is a first century BC Jewish text written in Greek called the Psalms of Solomon, a precious document. In chapters 17 and 18, the author describes the Messiah for whose coming the nation is waiting. He is described as a conqueror who will drive the Roman oppressors out of the land and create a kingdom of righteousness. And when Jesus failed to step into that role, the role of the political Messiah, the conqueror of nations, the crowd turned against him in disappointment. In our deeply divided, culturally conflicted society today, we may sometimes doubt that the crowd, that the public possesses the goodwill and the faith to carry on in the great experiment of American democracy. But I want you to notice that even among the crowds who followed Jesus to the cross, there were some who mourned. According to Luke chapter 23, verse 27, quote, and there followed as Jesus walked through the street with the cross until part of it was taken by Simon of Cyrene. There followed him a great multitude of people and of women who bewailed and lamented. But Jesus turning to them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves. And then later, Luke describes how as Jesus hung there between heaven and earth and prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. The crowd fell silent, according to Luke, and the people who stood by were watching. And then comes a crucial statement in Luke's gospel. Luke 23, 43, listen. And all the multitudes, when they saw what had taken place, 
they returned to Jerusalem beating their breasts. A clear sign of remorse and regret. And then, on the day of Pentecost, when the disciples of Jesus came out of hiding and went back out onto the streets of Jerusalem to continue his work, Luke says that when the crowds heard the message of Simon Peter, they were cut to the heart. Peter told them, you must repent and believe. For, Peter said, the promise is to you and to all of your children. So the first thing we learn tonight at the foot of the cross is that we must not, as disciples of Jesus, give up on the crowds. We must continue to reach out, as you are doing here in the ministry of this great church. People may yet repent, and the promise is to them and to all of us. Next, as we work our way around the foot of the cross, I would like to approach the women who, according to Mark, were observing at a distance. Uh, the Greek expression is apomakrothen, so from a distance. And among those women were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus and a number of others who, Mark says, were accustomed to follow him and to serve him. And many others who had come up with him to Jerusalem. Now this expression that Mark uses, that they were standing at a distance. The New Testament commentator, rather conservative spirit, Raymond Brown, thinks that Mark portrays the women followers of Jesus as inadequate because they stood at a distance. And he contrasts the women with the centurion who stood near the cross and who confessed his faith. But this judgment by the esteemed commentator simply ignores the political reality of the first century. The Roman writer Petronius, first century writer, tells the story of a Roman soldier at Ephesus who neglected the duty of preventing family members and friends from drawing near to the cross. And while the soldier slept, the family of the crucified came and took him down. So we may assume, I think, that the guards were there in order to prevent contact between family members, friends, and the crucified. The Jewish writer Philo, a contemporary of Jesus, tells us that the Roman governor of Egypt, Flaccus, would not permit family members to come near to the cross lest they take the bodies of the crucified down. So, the women in the Gospel of Mark are risking their lives by their presence, even at a distance. More than this, Mark says that they followed Jesus. 
down from Galilee, and that they served him. And the two Greek verbs, Stephen, that are used here, akoluthain, does not describe ordinary following. It is the kind of following that a disciple does. And the verb that is translated to serve is the Greek verb diakonein, from which we get our word deacon. So they are disciples and ministers, these women. And there is something special about the tense of those verbs. They are both in the imperfect tense, which means that their action continued. Even at the foot of the cross, the women were still following as disciples. They were still serving as ministers. Think what it must have meant to Jesus as he hung there dying to look out and to see that there were still faithful disciples, that there were still caring ministers. Of course, we cannot read these words today without thinking about the mothers of the disappeared in Argentina who carried pictures of their sons around in the public square. We cannot read this story without thinking about the mothers in the Ukraine whose children have died or who have been forced to flee the country in order to keep their children safe. Third, at the foot of the cross, let us approach the beloved disciple and the mother of Jesus, Mary. According to the Gospel of John, chapter 18, the beloved disciple was the only one of the twelve who did not flee. When Jesus was arrested, he followed Jesus and the temple police to the home of the high priest. And after Peter had denied Jesus, this disciple, the beloved disciple, is the only faithful male to follow Jesus to the cross. Like the women, the beloved disciple risked violating Roman law, which forbade friends and family members from approaching the crucified. So clearly, we are meant to understand that he is the disciple par excellence. But what is his secret. Why is he the only faithful male disciple? Well, as a New Testament scholar, of course, Steve, I'm convinced that the clues, the answer, is there in the text. As you may remember, church, Jesus looks down from the cross and says to his mother, woman, Look, behold, your son. And he says to the beloved disciple, Look, behold, your mother. This is Jesus' last action on earth. And the language that John uses, the verb that is translated, look, signals that a revelation is about to happen. The importance of what Jesus does here is highlighted by the fact that a few verses later, John tells us, and after this, 
after the revelation of a new relationship between the beloved disciple and his mother. And after this, Jesus knowing that everything was fulfilled. In other words, what Jesus did in relationship to his mother and the beloved disciple was his last willed act on earth. What is the secret? It is clearly the revelation of a new relationship, a relationship that did not exist before, that can now be seen. But what is the nature of that relationship? Well, again, I'm convinced that the answer is found in the text. The clue is there when John reports from that hour, the disciple, the beloved disciple, took her, that is Mary, to his own. Now, most interpreters and indeed most translators supply the word home to his own home. But that word is not found, Steve, in the Greek text. And I don't think Jesus was particularly concerned about merely providing lodging. That, as if that were the ultimate purpose of his life. Surely the phrase, his own, points to the special relationship that Jesus had with this disciple. The fact that the mother of Jesus is now the disciple's mother and that he has taken her into his own is a way of describing how one who was related to Jesus according to the flesh, that is, his natural mother, now becomes related to him and to all other disciples in the Spirit. That's clear enough, but for me, it only deepens the mystery. Because what is that special relationship into which Mary has now been taken? And finally, the final clue is the repeated description of this disciple as the one whom Jesus loved. In other words, the beloved disciple is the one who did not forget who he was. He did not forget even in the face of trauma and tragedy that he was the one who was deeply loved by Jesus. And because he remembered that, because he knew himself to be so deeply loved, he was able to be faithful, to stand alongside Mary at the foot of the cross. And the lesson, church, for us, I believe, is clear. I'm here to tell you tonight that you are the ones who are so deeply loved. In this Holy Week, the message for us is to know that. To know that we are the ones whom Jesus loved. And in that love, in the knowledge of ourselves as the beloved, we will find the fortitude to remain faithful even in the face of tragedy. Next to the last is the thief. 
Jesus was crucified between two bandits or thieves. According to the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Mark, he was put to death between these two, and Luke adds that the first thing Jesus spoke after he was nailed to the cross were the words, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. And the good thief heard those words so that when the other bandit began to revile Jesus, began to say to him, save yourself and take us with you. The good thief rebuked his colleague and said, do you not fear God? Since we are under a just condemnation, but this man, what wrong has he done? And then the good thief said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And according to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus answered him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, I would submit, church, that the good thief was able to perceive that Jesus' kingdom would not die along with him because he heard Jesus pray, Father, forgive them. Why do I draw that conclusion? Because the pages of ancient literature are full of examples of crucified victims who spoke angrily from the cross. Most often the crucified returned the taunts and the mockery of the crowd. The philosopher Seneca refers to persons who, when they were stretched out on the crosses, heaped insults upon all around them and even spit upon the spectators. The Jewish historian Josephus mentions a Jew of Jopata who was crucified by the Roman soldiers and who cursed and taunted his tormentors as he died. By contrast, one of those two thieves who was crucified alongside Jesus, heard something miraculous, something impossible. He heard the crucified Jesus pray, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. And that prayer so deeply touched the heart of the thief he heard it, and at that moment he knew that the kingdom of God would not perish along with Jesus. And so he asked Jesus, Jesus, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And the lesson for us tonight, church, is clear. As we hear Jesus' prayer, even for those who abused him, his plea to God for forgiveness, we should know that the kingdom of Jesus goes on, that it does not perish despite the evil in this world, and 
we must go on believing in it as the good thief did. Finally, church, I invite you to listen to the voice of the last speaker at the foot of the cross, a Roman centurion. Mark tells us, but the centurion who had been standing there opposite him, having seen that he expired in this way, said, truly this man was the Son of God. Now class, church, what had he seen? What had he heard? In the Gospel of Mark, he heard Jesus cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How did that cry lead the centurion to conclude that this man was not a frustrated revolutionary, but that he was indeed the agent of God, the Son of God? Well, I think, again, the answer is found in the text. Mark uses a particular verb to describe Jesus' death cry. And it is the Greek verb, boan. It's an onomatopoetic verb. It sounds like what it is. Boan. And now, church, I would ask you to say that verb with me. Can you? Boan. One more time. Boan. Now here's the importance of it. It is a cry not of despair. It is a cry for help. If you look that verb up in the Greek dictionary, it is not a cry of despair. It is a call for help, for aid. And the crowd at the foot of the cross interpreted it that way. They thought he was calling for help from Elijah. Let's wait and see if Elijah comes for him. So that's my first point. The centurion heard Jesus call for help. Secondly, he heard in Jesus' last words a prayer. Jesus died with Words addressing God. My God! My God! In other words, Jesus had not lost faith. He had not lost the confidence to appeal to God for help. Third, the words... Jesus' last words that the centurion heard, they are the first line of a psalm, Psalm 22. When you leave here tonight, go back and read that psalm. Psalm 22 is a psalm of lament or complaint. It begins with the psalmist lamenting to God complaining about all the evil and injustice in the world. But halfway through the psalm, in verse 22, there is a dramatic turning point. The psalmist says, But you, O Lord, come quickly to my soul, and I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. And it continues, For the Lord did not despise the affliction of the afflicted. And all the ends of the earth will remember it. 
and they will turn to the Lord. And future generations will be told about the Lord and will proclaim His deliverance to a people yet unborn. So when the centurion heard Jesus begin a psalm of lament, the centurion recognized that Jesus had not lost hope. He still hoped in the redemption of future generations. And finally, church, I would argue that what the centurion heard was a question. My God, my God, why? It is a question with which Jesus dies. A question that could only be answered by God. And we believe, and in a few days on Easter Sunday, we will celebrate the fact that God answered that question. Already the author of the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 5, verse 7, says that when Jesus cried out, he was heard. Well, let me bring this to a conclusion. So, like Jesus, we live with questions. We don't have all the answers derived from some beatific vision. As disciples of Jesus, how do we live with those questions? With the haunting question, why? Well, let me remind us that the author of the oldest gospel, Mark, wrote his work for a persecuted people, for poor followers of Jesus living on the wrong side of the river in Nero's Rome. And yet, Mark has given us tonight three examples of a faithful response to the haunting question, why did Jesus die? Number one, like the centurion, we can respond in witness. We can find new and relevant ways to witness that there was one life that was fully authenticated by God. That there is a model life at the center of human history. That's what the centurion is witnessing when he says, truly this man was the Son of God. Second, Mark offers the example of the women who followed and served even in the face of death, even as they watched the tragedy unfolding in front of them. And that should be our response, to keep on following, to keep on serving. And finally, there is this marginal figure, this boundary figure, who appears in the text of Mark's Gospel just after Jesus has died. Joseph of Arimathea, who is described by Mark as a respected member of the Jewish Council of Elders. But Mark adds, he was himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. And so he went boldly to Pilate and he asked for the body of Jesus. And Mark chapter 15 verse 46 concludes the story. And he, that is Joseph of Arimathea, bought, he purchased 
in the marketplace fine linen. And he took him down from the cross and wrapped him in the linen and led him and laid him in a sepulcher which was hewn out of rock. Notice that Joseph of Arimathea, even after Jesus has died, does not give up. He does two things that are clearly marked by the Greek verbs that Mark uses. First, the verb tolmao, which is translated, he boldly asked. He dared to ask for the body of Jesus from the governor who had pronounced sentence. And then that second verb, agorazo. He went into the agora, agorazo, into the public square, and he put his own money at the disposal of the Jesus movement. He bought fine linen and carefully wrapped the body. So, church, we have three responses, three examples. We can witness like the centurion. We can follow and serve like the women. And we can, we can wait expectantly for the kingdom of God, like Joseph of Arimathea, whose waiting was not passive. It expressed itself in bold action and in faithful sacrifice and expenditure. Well, these are the lessons that we have learned at the foot of the cross. And I pray that the message of each of these witnesses fills us with faith and hope in the difficult days ahead. Glory to God. Amen.